will rain hell down from on high. The Battle of the Atlantic was the longest campaign of World War II. In the new movie Greyhound, we followed Tom Hanks as Captain Ernest Krauss of the USS Keeling over three days as convoy HX-25 crosses the Atlantic in February of 1942. Playing the role of a captain is not new to Tom Hanks. He was Captain Jim Lovell in Apollo 13. He played Captain Richard Phillips of the Maersk, Alabama when attacked by Somali pirates. He played captain of a raft alongside Wilson in Castaway, and as an army captain in Saving Private Ryan. It is that last depiction that is perhaps the most important, as this is Hanks reprising his role similar to what he did back in 1998. This time, instead of saving Matt Damon, it is a convoy of 37 merchant ships and the Allied war effort. On this, the inaugural NASO Movie Review, we're joined by Dr. Chuck Steele, Associate Professor at the United States Air Force Academy. Chuck was the course chair for the World War II at Sea class at the Air Force Academy. We're joined by Dr. David Conant, Director of the John Hattendorf Center for Maritime Historical Research at the Naval War College. Also joined by Dr. Joseph Moretz, Independent Scholar and Researcher on the Royal Navy. The views expressed by our presenters are theirs alone and do not represent their institutions or that of the U.S. government. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. I'm an associate professor of history at Campbell University, and while my views are not representative of the U.S. government, they most assuredly should be. Welcome to the NASO Movie Review of Greyhound. Welcome to our first Na NASO Movie Review. I brought together a, a award-winning group of naval historians to review the Tom Hanks movie Greyhound. So let me put this out here for our historians from the very beginning. Let's add some context to this movie. This movie depicts a single convoy battle, HX-25, in February of 1942. And the perspective we get isn't really from the entire convoy, but it's on one ship. And more importantly, it's from one officer. So I thought, Joe, if I could start off with you, let's talk about the context about these uh, convoy battles. Uh, the Royal Navy has been waging this war for quite a bit at this point. So maybe you can set some context for us. So Britain realizes that war is probably going to come. And of course, Britain declares war on the 3rd of September, 1939. And from that date, okay, it is fighting a naval war. And everyone else is kind of fighting the phony war. But the naval war is real. Now, of course, officers, senior officers like uh, Admiral of the Fleet, uh, Sir Dudley Pound, you know, they're veterans of the First World War. And so they have that context of what a naval war looks like. And they very much have the context of what a U-boat war potentially would look like. I think the second thing to bear in mind too, though, is the Battle of the Atlantic is kind of a misnomer, okay? We can think of the Battle of Waterloo being a one-day event. We can think of Battle of Gettysburg being a three-day event, Battle of Midway being a three-day event, okay? Maybe four days, depending on how you want to stretch it. But the Battle of the Atlantic runs from the first day of war to the end of the war. And the other thing is, it's part of a naval war that is global. And of course, as Admiral Richmond said uh, in the late 1930s, you can't fight a two ocean war with a one ocean Navy. And the Navy has more war that it can deal with. Okay? It's stretched thin in the Mediterranean. It's very much stretched thin in the Pacific. And in fact, it's losing Singapore at this time. Right? So, it's fighting the naval war. It doesn't have enough ships. It's lost many ships through things like action in Norway, through the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force in uh, France, okay? and of course the operations going on in the Eastern Mediterranean with the intervention in Greece and then the uh, withdrawal from Crete. So the Navy's under a great deal of strain. Okay, so it doesn't have the destroyers that it needs, but. Uh, the other thing, too, to bear in mind is the Royal Navy works very closely with the Royal Canadian Navy, okay, with the Royal Australian Navy. Okay. Those two uh, Dominion navies are very important. But the other thing that's important, too, to realize is that from March 1941 on, the U.S. Navy is playing a very increasing role in operations in the North Atlantic. That's great, Joe. I appreciate that. You know, and one of the things I think right from the very beginning for me kind of took me a little bit out of the movie for a second 
is when they identify this as HX-25, the convoy, you know, HX-25 is like March of 1940. This is, if, if this convoy is anything, it's like HX-175. It, it is it is deep into the, into the convoy battles by this point. And Dave, I want to come over to you because, again, the, the depiction we get here is of a captain who is at the twilight of his career. He's given, you know, obviously one of the top line destroyers in the U.S. Navy, a Fletcher class destroyer. And then he's doing battle. It's his first pass, you know, first crossing of the Atlantic, which he, you know, it was in the trailer and at the very end of the movie. But yet the battle in the Atlantic had been going on for quite a while for the U.S. Navy. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the U.S. Navy's role here in the Battle of the Atlantic, particularly in this early part. So uh, it's difficult to respond to that in the sense that the movie has almost nothing to do with what really happened in the so called Battle of the Atlantic. The depiction of uh, the Krauss character is a very um, compelling depiction. I mean, Tom Hanks is a wonderful actor. And um, really, I think he tells a, a, an interesting sea story. But it's closer to a Star Trek episode than I think anything that we're talking about with regards to history. Uh, almost none of the technology uh, that is portrayed in the movie existed at the time that supposedly this convoy battle took place. Uh, centimetric radar was just really still in the drawing books. Um, the CIC concept did not exist in the United States Navy. The Fletcher class uh, did not actually exist in the United States Navy at the time portrayed. Uh, and when they did exist in the United States Navy, uh, the Fletcher class was primarily deployed to the Pacific. Uh, so, you know, just Starting from that basis, it's really hard to respond to a historical question uh, in relation to this movie. Uh, the other part of this, of course, is that when we see the PBY at the end of the movie uh, dropping the bombs, I mean, this is a standard tactic. It happened in the, in the war at sea, certainly, but it certainly didn't happen the way it was portrayed in 1942. Flat-nosed bombs? I don't think so. So when we're looking at movies like this, we have to ask ourselves the question, what, what, are, what are we looking for in these movies? And I suspect that we're probably not the audience that Tom Hanks had in mind when he put this movie together. Um, I wonder sometimes when uh, Hollywood does tackle a historical topic, uh, why they make so, some of the choices that they make. And so I think when we look at the Battle of the Atlantic as a history, we have to set that aside. Uh, and then maybe we should look at the literary fiction that uh, Tom Hanks was inspired uh, by in, in writing the script for this movie. Um, and then let's talk about how that fiction was created. Uh, and, and with that, I think we would have to start with C.S. Forrester himself. Well, and, and I think that's a great point to go to because this is based on a C.S. Forrester book. And, and if anybody knows C.S. Forrester, it's from his work in the Hornblower series, the most famous he does. But he, he also does a, a vast literary work in The Good Shepherd is the, is the book that this is based on. And he does a, a much more than just Hornblower. But, but even in the Hornblower series, one of the things we see is it tends to focus on a central character. You know, everybody else is secondary to Hornblower and we follow Hornblower through a series – of literary, you know, events that in many ways are compilations of figures all put together into the hornblower and at times very fanciful and, and, and hard to believe. So Chuck, I was, I was wanting to come to you over on this one is, is maybe you kick us off on this is what did you think about the depiction having read the Forrester book and then, and then looking at the movie, what did you take away from, from that depiction of the good shepherd into a movie? Yeah. I, I, <clears throat> I thought it was a really entertaining film uh, for one, but I, I think, you know, as Dave's sort of calling our attention to this, it, it's, it's something of a departure from an accurate depiction of, of uh, you know, the American role in the Valley Atlantic, certainly uh, in February of 1942. Uh, and I think in some ways it's also a departure from the book uh, in, in a number of ways. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound too harsh because that's a pretty, even though The Good Shepherd's a relatively short book, uh, it's still a tall task to take that book and and you know pare it down into something that that runs for less than an hour and a half and is is going to hold your attention. Um, you know, there, there all sorts of things. That, you know, the character Krauss, you know, in the in the book is a a, a forty. You know, 
he's he's old for a destroyer captain. He's 42 years old. Um, and in Tom Hanks's case, I think he was 63 when he made this movie. So, um, you know, that's that's one thing that kind of it, it, Tom Hanks is a great actor. And within 20 minutes, I don't care, you know, how old the character is he's supposed to be playing. I'm, I'm buying it. But just, uh, you know, at, at first glance, um, you know, he seems to be a much older character than, than what the book uh, gives us, uh, which I think also was one of those things when you talk about accuracy is, you know, sort of how short a naval career is or, or how intense a naval career is uh, that, you know, you would look at somebody who is, you know, at, at 42, uh, <laughs> being a whopping 56, at 42 is over the hill. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think there are certain things, certain elements, um, in the book that, that uh, as long as Tom Hanks was going to take center stage, that, that sort of got sacrificed. Uh, you know, there's also the business, uh, it, it, you know, it struck me as just being hard. There's the business of try, trying to, to get a very deep character uh, like Krauss. Cause I do think, you know, he's, as you said, the typical Forrester character, you know, he's struggling against so many things uh, in the book. He, he takes the assignment to the Atlantic to basically escape uh, you know, the Elizabeth Shue character because his heart's been broken, she's having an affair. So, uh, you know, he's got his own personal demons that, that, that are, are tormenting him. And I think it was really hard for them to develop uh, the tension that he's feeling uh, by, you know, being in this new assignment. I mean, he's not new to destroyers. And obviously, you know, uh, there's the whole issue Dave brings up about the Fletchers not being there. In the book, it's supposed to be a Mahan class destroyer, which would still uh, had been on. I think the Mahans were almost exclusively in the Pacific as well. Um, but there's, it's, it's hard for them to develop. I don't know. I didn't get this. Maybe you guys can chime in on it, but when he gets this assignment, uh, as Joe mentioned, the Royal Navy has been struggling through this, this war. Uh, you know, a good, a good point of contrast would be Montserrat's book, the cruel sea, uh, for something that develops sort of how long this, this fight's been going on and how new the Americans are to it. But, there's you're missing this whole, this whole tension that here's a guy who has you know all of a sudden found himself in command of of the escorts in a convoy and he is the least experienced of all of these people one of the destroyers in the book is is polish uh in the film they're they're you know two brits and, and a canadian uh corvette uh but there's the uncertainty i mean that's the thing that he's struggling against uh, it's not just that, you know, he's trying to escape a, a bad love life, but now all of a sudden he finds himself in a position where he's waging war against the Germans and has zero experience in this. And the people that he's commanding have, you know, ample experience in this. So I think there's a lot of things that are are in the book that don't make it through to the movie. Well, you know, let's talk about that a little bit, because I think that's an interesting aspect to look at, too. And I also think I'll throw this out here, too. If it's not Tom Hanks in this starring role, do we care about I mean, there's no character development. I mean, there the entire right. Elizabeth Shue scene is, is like four minutes, you know, and that's it. And like if you watch the trailer, you got that scene, you know, it, it, and and. And it's it's not even that bad of a scene when you see it. She's like, "Well, I'm just not decided not to come with you." There's nothing about the love life. There's nothing about that. You really don't get that image too that he's the junior captain because, you know, the the on the TBS, you know, the talk between ships. Which, by the way, he's using a sound powered phone the entire time, which drove me crazy right there. <laughs> but but anyway, you know, just small technical thing. And 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 I think, I think they used way too much of the kid. I hate to even say this, but I I think they you know because they had the kid, which is a destroyer down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, which you can go see. It's great. Fantastic, but they, I think they were so welded to the kid that they didn't want to make any changes. Which is, I, I think, goes to what Dave was talking about before: is they're using technology that is much later in the war because it's on the kid right then, and they were using it. But anyway, you know, if it's not Hanks, I, I don't know if I would ever like this guy or even know anything about him. I don't even know if I watched the movie because because you just take for granted oh, it's Tom Hanks. You know, I, I I can I can kind of defer on that. But let's talk about some of those departures, because the departures, I think, are big. So go ahead. I'm sorry. I cut somebody off there. I, I just wanted to build off of something that Chuck said and also what you're saying. Uh, first of all, Tom Hanks, again, I don't want to take away from this image of the uh, modern day uh, sort of Bogart uh, actor. Uh, he's a tremendous actor. I think he's probably a really wonderful guy individually, but he's 64 years old, for God's sakes. And 
you know, the highest ranking admiral in the United States Navy in 1942, Ernest J. King, was 64 years old. It was a full uh, retirement. So, you know, and the idea of a 42-year-old lieutenant commander taking command for the first time in his career in 1942 is basically impossible. He would have been pruned uh, by, by the retention boards long before he ever stepped foot on the keeling. Uh, in real terms. Um, what I would say about the fiction of The Good Shepherd, uh, I think that the book itself has an interesting place in the in the historiography of the Second World War. And I think if Tom Hanks would have done this movie as portrayed, you know, as a fictional book, it might have been a pretty good movie. Uh, but as it stands now, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to say, uh, it's it's probably worse from a historical standpoint than even the mo the Midway movie. Uh, and it's creating work for people like ourselves who are historians who have to de who have to deal with popular mythology uh, as accepted uh, in, in the grander, you know, public stage. It's how, uh, I was wondering if I could add something here. Sure, please. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, uh, definitely, the, you know, there, there's a problem with the movie as far as history, okay? We, we accept that. And I don't know anything about making movies, but I'm sure the director, you know, has to make a lot of compromises, right? I mean, they have to put something out there that's going to be entertaining, first and foremost, okay? I accept that. But there's also problems with history in, as far as uh, in, in uh, C.S. Forrester's book. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, February 1942 is an interesting period because this is a time when the United States is now in the war and the U-boats have basically left the North Atlantic and they've gone to the East Coast of the United States and the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. And so there's a great deal of shipping that's being lost. It's not being lost under convoy in the North Atlantic. It's being lost off the coast of New Jersey. It's being lost... Uh, off the coast of uh, Texas, and Florida, you know. So again, people who write fiction borrow from history, but they don't necessarily borrow from it accurately. I guess this is the point to be made. Uh, the other thing I would say too is, in the work, both in in the book and in the movie, and I think more so in the movie, the convoy uh, screen is seen as much more effective. Than it actually was. And I think it, it was the case that in February 1942, only two U boats were sunk okay, in uh, the Atlantic. And, and here we have a convoy export basically sinking four, possibly <laughs> three and one probable, right? You know, so, okay, that happens. You know, you have USS England in the Pacific and, you know, uh, late in the war, but, uh, it, I, you know, Forrester himself doesn't even get to history right now. I think we need to keep that in mind. Right. And I think that's that's always a big thing. Again, we're, we're not reviewing this movie based on the cinematography and, and which we can talk about and all that, you know, which is which is or the acting or anything like that. We're basing it purely on the history of the event. And you're exactly right, Joe. German submarine warfare was asymmetric. They would go wherever the defenses were the weakest. And, and that's something you see throughout the early part of the war. And they really don't get the big convoy battles, so they have to fight the convoy battles in the Black Pit, which is much later in the war that we see happen. And, you know, and I also think this movie suffers from, from another aspect, too, and, and I want to talk about this, is, you know, cinematography is, you know, I, I think this movie criminally didn't get a chance to be put on the big screen. I I, I, I really do. I, I, th I think this is a big screen type movie, and, I, and, and you know, we all had to watch this on, on Apple TV and everything, and, and my personal gripe right now is Apple TV. I'm going to say this right now to the demigods at Apple TV is you make it very difficult to watch a movie on your on your program if you don't have an Apple ID. And I literally had to borrow a phone from someone who because I don't have an iPhone to, to log on to watch this movie. So so Steve Jobs, wherever you're at, I'm not happy with you. Um, <laughs> but but the, I, you know let, let's talk about the depiction for a second because I think it is an interesting one. I, I think I think very few movies depict battle the way this does. And, and again, we're, we're dealing with CGI, obviously. So we're dealing with, the, with that. But let's talk about that a little bit, because I want to get your perspectives on that. What did you think about how the battles were portrayed when they were in combat? I, I mean, obviously, we get a little bit of Call of Duty style in here, uh, maybe too much. But I was interested in your perspective on it. Chuck, do you want to start off? Well, I, was just, I, I thought it was 
you know, pretty interesting that the uh, five inch gun was the most effective weapon in uh, combating U boats. Um, I think that was uh, I, that was that was it was exciting, but uh, didn't seem accurate. And and yeah, I got to say, you know, as 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 for what was you know just said, you know, Joe's talking about the about the Atlantic and think about ratios. You know that you know that. The, I think you know in the film it's they they lose seven seven ships in the convoy uh you know and they kill you know four submarines uh which you know uh, it's you know it's sort of the, the Germans get a, a 2 to 1 kill ratio or something that's that really seems uh you know that's that's just hard if if you're thinking about 1942 uh it, I mean that's one of those things that really sort of stretches uh, you know, stretches your, your ability to suspend your disbelief. And, and so I think, and, you know, and again, so when you're saying, you know, what was the combat thing? Well, I mean, the ratios are really messed up and to have something that's so intense that say in the last, I don't know what that was last five, 10 minutes of the movie, when they get two, you know, two quick kills on, on U-boats, um, you know, and, and yeah, one with guns and the other, you know, firing guns and directing a, a PBY to, you know, to buy, it's just, no, that was a photon torpedo, Chuck. <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I just gonna say that it's like that. It was super exciting. I was like, you know, wow, this is, you know, this is this is thrilling. And, but it, it it bears no resemblance to reality. So that's, you know, that's it, it, sometimes it sucks if you're, you know, I, I think you know a history professor and you go to the movies because it's just, you know, you're 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 struggling against all of the best efforts of the movie maker to, to draw you in and, and thrill you. And, and I was certainly thrilled, but you know, afterwards it's, you know, you have this sort of, ah, yeah, but that, that, that's just so beyond credibility that it, it's just, it's hard. It's, it's, you know, and so that's, that's kind of where I stand on it. It's um, you know, too much, too much fighting with the wrong weapons and and achieving results that would have been you know unattainable at any point. So it, it, it's almost like feeling like you have a hangover. So let me go over to Dave here for this. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you think about it, Dave? I agree with uh, with everything that Chuck said, and and I would say that having been in the Navy and Sal, you know as well, you know, being at sea is wonderful um, because the the pace of of operations at sea is is a lot uh, it's it's certainly not as fast paced as portrayed in the movie and i think tom hanks you know had to condense timelines and everything else to get the story that he wanted to tell uh across on the on the big screen but what's missing in that of course is the long periods of of no activity uh and seasickness and just sipping coffee and smoking a cigarette on the bridge wing, uh, which, you know, I think in the movie portrayal of Nicholas Montserrat's, you know, classic, uh, The Cruel Sea, did a much better job of portraying a realistic experience in the battle, the so-called Battle of the Atlantic. And of course, this group knows that there's no single Battle of the Atlantic, it's a campaign. And when we talk about the German point of view in, the convoy battles of the Atlantic, we have to think about, first of all, the assumptions that the Germans made about Britain. Uh, and as Joe pointed out, you know, Britain's an island nation, and if we can strike hard quickly, the British will, will simply roll over, and, you know, they're pacifists now and all this. These are really bad assumptions on the part of the Germans. Uh, they also did not make good assumptions about the willingness of Franklin Roosevelt to assert uh, Mera Labrum, uh, the, the freedom of the seas, and, and to say, hey, look, uh, commerce trading of, of a friend, i.e. Britain, uh, is not acceptable, and we're going to reflag some of those merchant ships to enable Britain to continue feeding themselves, you know, and uh, of course, that's what gets you into 1941, February, with the re-establishment uh, of geographic fleets, the Atlantic fleet falling under Ernest King, of course. And during that summer of 41, uh, going into 1942, we're really conducting a quasi-war at sea, uh, not dissimilar from other quasi-wars of the past. 
And of course, in Halloween night, 1941, the sinking of the Reuben James uh, is really uh, the moment when most Americans are starting to say, you know, we're probably going to go to war in Europe. And everybody's recognizing that. And the shock is, is an, an actual shock of Pearl Harbor out in the Pacific. Uh, and I think that when we sort of lay out the actual history that uh, would get us to February of 1942, the way the movie handles this, this actual history is not very well done. Uh, the other part of this, of course, uh, as uh, I think Chuck or, or, or Joe might have mentioned earlier, is that during that period, or maybe it was you, Sal, I can't recall, um, the Germans were actually conducting individual operations off the American East Coast during that, that immediate period following Pearl Harbor in February 42. Coincident with that is when they introduced the fourth rotor in the Enigma cipher, uh, which is the beginning of what they called the blackout at Bletchley Park. And that's one of the major reasons why the Germans were able to have so much success during that period. The convoy battles as depicted in the movie happen in 1940-41, and certainly they happened again in the spring of 43. But that type of convoy battle did not take place at all during the period depicted in the movie. Unfortunately, I do see this movie as a lost victory for Tom Hanks. I, I got to say, I, I agree. You know, and what, what really makes me interesting about it, this is, I mean, he had time. We, had, we had, I mean, it's an 80 minute movie. I mean, there was 10 minutes there. You could have filled with that kind of, like you said, that waiting, that listening to the sonar, you know, that kind of, that kind of, you know, just that, you know, you know, because I, I thought they took so many little, small little things to remove suspense out of you. Like, like the images on the side of the submarines. I, I think you get more suspense if you don't know which submarine that is, you know, if, if you don't, if, if it's not clear who is, you know, is that one submarine? Is that eight submarines? I don't know. They didn't know. Why, why should we know as the viewer what's going on? I thought that took a lot out of that. Joe, what about you, the depiction of the, of the combat here? The war is vital for Britain because Britain is an island. Okay? It cannot even feed itself, so it has to import food. It needs, it can manufacture aircraft, tanks, but it cannot manufacture the numbers that are required for this type of war against an industrial power, which is Nazi Germany. Uh, you know, as far as the actual convoy battle, I, again, what, what I'd say is, I think they show the escorts too close in initially, okay? Because I think my, re, my understanding is that initially, before you make contact, the escort's been further out, so you don't get the mutual interference from the uh, convoy for your sonar listening and your hydrophone listening. The, the second thing is, this is before, certainly the British, so you've got a British destroyer and a Canadian destroyer depicted in the movie. This is before they had developed pre-planned tactics, right? So if this happens, this is what we do automatically, right? Wouldn't it, that cuts down on the inner bridge communication, right? Because you you know automatically what you're going to do. Well, that kind of gets developed late in 1942 when they stand up the uh, Western Approaches Tactical Unit uh, in Liverpool under uh, mm -hmm. Captain Gilbert Roberts. Uh, so. I, I, I think, you know, what's also kind of missing here is I don't doubt that the Canadian Navy and the Royal Navy know how to interoperate. I mean, they do that, right? It's, it's one glove. I think the how well the U.S. Navy would have played in that, I think, is, a, is an issue. Okay. Yeah, but the thing that gets me in, in this movie, and, and I, I gotta say, there were some things I liked. I mean, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about that because I, I thought they did some things, but if you didn't catch it very well, you wouldn't notice it. You know, I, I thought, for example, like the depth charges, for example. I mean, he drops that double pattern on that decoy, and and then all of a sudden he finds out he's got six depth charges left. You know, yeah. so there's a logistics issue there that, you know, this isn't, you know, <laughs> this this isn't was it the Robert Mitchum movie and in, in submarines in the 1950s where he's uh, uh hunting. You know, he drops like 200 depth charges off a Buckley class destroyer escort. You know, it, it's you know he's a finite amount of ammunition here. I I liked him running on the bridge wings. If you ever maneuver a ship, I mean that's something you. Do. You know, you're always kind of moving back and forth all the time. I, I was really particularly taken. There was one part I thought that was really interesting, and that was the burial of of his uh, mess uh, uh, cook, Cleveland. And you know, I don't know if you, it's so short to catch it, but you know, the the doctor or whoever the medical guy was sat there and said that they were you know kind of blown to pieces. And when they dumped the bodies, you know, in the burial there, the you, the body gets hung up, and you can kind of tell. 
You know, so you get you get that kind of little bit of visual, but not enough. It's just it's so quick that I don't think most people would catch that. And, and maybe Hanks thinks he's being subtle or not with that. I, I don't know, but it, this this tended to be to me so focused on Hanks the character yeah. that everything else was the backdrop, and, and you didn't get that. So I was wondering what you guys thought what worked with the movie. What was it that 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 was a positive for you that that you can sit there and say, okay, that that's that's something that we could we should be able to build off of to talk about as historians, for example. Jack, you want to start off? <laughs> the, the the last line when you said things we could talk about as historians, that's kind of like, you know, I because you know, my mind my mind went back to to the two books, to the Cruel Sea and to the Good Shepherd, and um, you know, I I, I do think again, it's it's got to be difficult. I mean, these are these are problems that that you know I've never you know never run through my mind. It's the easiest thing in the world to be the critic. It's a lot harder to be the author, you know, and this is. Uh, this is this is one of those instances. I I do think I say just there's a lot having read the book that you want or read the books that you you want to have more time or or, or more attention you know put into what what this guy is struggling. But I will say you know I I did get a lot out of Tom Hanks' expressions you know and you know I did get a sense that that you know here's a guy that's you know, troubled by all of this responsibility, you know, the stuff that's missing, you know, for me was the, well, you know, other than the, the enormous responsibility of trying to safeguard a convoy, you know, what are the other things that are driving his insecurity? Like, you know, the business about, you know, being, being put in charge of a bunch of people who this is their business. They know better than you do. They've been doing this longer than you have. I think that that's the sort of thing that gets lost is that that little bit of detail. Um, you know, it's it's hard to, you know, it's like as, as historians, I think, you know, maybe in the broadest sense, you know, you look at this um, and it's I, I think you do get a sense of the awesome responsibility of command, period. I mean, you can feel the weight that regardless of all those others, you can feel the weight that is on Tom Hanks's his shoulders. So I think that that's probably, you know, I think that's one of those things that it, I, I'm fascinated by by naval history for, for a lot of reasons. But one is, you know, I spent most of my life teaching at, at service academies and you're preparing people to be leaders. And the farther up the, the ladder you go, the more responsibility you get saddled with. And, and you know, I, I think it did a, a, a pretty good job of exposing you to the sense that Man, it's really lonely. It, it might not, you know, he's not Ernest J. King. He's not all the way at the top, but in the middle of the North Atlantic, he is in charge. There's nobody that's above him. And all of that response, every time, a, a, you know, a merchant ship goes up, that's on him. You know, every time something bad happens, he, he owns a piece of that. And I really did feel that. And I think that's, that's, I think that's, I think that's maybe something that's a value but even then, so, even then, even then, I don't think he gets called a task on that. I mean, there's a moment when he stops to pick up some survivors, and and you know, I think that's a big decision he makes. He decides to pick up these survivors off this tanker. He gets four crewmen picked up. Meanwhile, the attack takes place on the back of the convoy, and he loses more ships. You know, but that's never even registered, really. I mean, it's just you yeah. know, you know, th that should be an angst to him, I think. So, well, I, just, you know, we we had talked about this a little bit before, and I, and again, I think it's you know it's difficult because you're trying to do this in the span of you know, an hour, 20 minutes, but that scene where, where, you know, the flares are going up and the camera pans up and, you know, you start to go above the clouds to see the, you know, the Aurora and it's, but you can still see these flashes below in the clouds. And, and for me, you know, that was, for me, at least that was registering. It's just like, there's, there's chaos, you know, beneath this beauty, there's, there's absolute chaos. And of course my concern is just like, yeah, and, and, and who is the guy that has to bring order out of this chaos? That that's you know that's that's all that I'm getting at you know where right. I you know I'm pulling from that. Dave, you want to add something? I'm sorry, we'll cut you out there. Well, so I would say that maritime history is so foreign to most people. Uh, the just the maritime dimension is so foreign, um, and I think uh, Samuel L. Morrison wrote about the the uh, his point was that if you want to write about maritime history, you have to you know know what it's like to be seasick and actually know the difference between port and starboard and, and you know, all of that. Um, so I think when Hollywood does try to tackle 
the maritime dimension as a as a uh, as a stage uh, or theatrical action, I think that's always probably a good thing uh, for maritime history. Um, you know, I, I, I would actually take that a little farther by saying that uh, space is also a maritime environment. And so uh, I would argue that uh, as soon as they dissolve the Air Force, Chuck, um, it'll be a, a great thing when uh, we get back to the exploration mission that the Navy has done so well for so many centuries. Um, so in that respect, I think that um, the fictional portrayal of action uh, in the North Atlantic in particular is useful uh, for the purposes of engaging audiences that might not otherwise think about that history. Uh, and that provides a foundation for, for you know, people like us to, to wax poetic about how terribly wrong it was and and that's how we can uh actually get to the point of educating each other about what really took place in in history um i do think that you know when you see technology portrayed in a, in a historical context that did not actually exist uh in the chronology as portrayed in the film i think that's just being sloppy uh to be honest um i think that they could have done better especially with the cgi technology in actually replicating a ship that might have existed. <clears throat> go ahead and replicate the Keeling, which didn't exist, and uh, go with the Forrester uh, sea story and, and actually make Forrester a character in the movie. That's how I would have written the script. Um, and then you can just say, hey, this is a, a, a literary fiction and it's OK and and place it into the genre, I think, of the Second World War as, as a literary piece. And I think that there's some interesting history about why Forrester wrote this book in the first place that could have been addressed in the context of the Tom Hanks movie that was not addressed. Uh, during the Second World War, Forrester himself, being a Brit, was actually sent to the United States where he worked for the British Security uh, Cooperation Organization out of New York City. The man called Intrepid was his boss. And one of the things that Forrester did during the war was to write serialized sort of sea stories uh, to generate support for Britain uh, during the Second World War. And of course, during the Second World War, Franklin Roosevelt was also very concerned about you know, the Imperial Japanese Empire. So the British were very concerned about the Americans losing focus on the Europe first uh, strategy that they were executing in the Second War. So, Forrester's job was to generate American support for Britain. And that's the genesis of the Good Shepherd sea story. Uh, 1952, uh, the movie The Cruel Sea is, is uh, one of the, the hit movies of, of the time. And C.S. Forrester is looking for opportunities to make a little bit of money. And he had already written up these fictions about the Keeling and and everything else and so he he went ahead and and wrote you know the, the good shepherd as as we're talking about uh as an effort to capitalize on the popularity of nicholas montserrat's uh book and i think that you know there's a lot here from a historical standpoint that we can all sort of wax on with the, the popular audience that unfortunately in the movie uh i think we, we just we don't get any of that whatsoever uh, and, I, and I wish that Tom Hanks, I think he's a very good actor. And, and indeed, I think he's a great movie producer uh, on par with the best uh, in, in American cinema. But I, I, I'm really disappointed, I'm sorry to say, in, in this movie, The Good but, Shepherd. In this movie. <laughs> No, no, I, I agree. I agree with you because I, I think the movie becomes almost like Castaway. I mean, he becomes the soul. I mean, he's in every scene. I mean, except for, you know, a few where, where they're cutting away or down to the CIC or something like that. He's in every scene and, and you don't get really a lot of context except for that opening pain and that, that closing pain, you know, for the opening of the war and the closing of the war. You know, you could have spent 10 minutes in, in, in you know, the convoy conference before leaving, you know, and, and personalize the ships that are being lost and everything. I, I think of movies like Action in the North Atlantic. I think of the yes. Cruel Sea. You know, Cruel Sea, I mean, the Compass Rose goes through the entire war without ever sinking a U-boat, but you get all that anxiety 
and 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 that moment of dropping depth charges on those survivors and just you know and and all I mean that is tension of epic proportion that comes in the book and in the movie. So I always think that that there are moments here, that, and again maybe it's it's Tom Hanks being such a huge actor that he can do what he wants and make a character based book around or movie around his figure, which I think is I, what Chuck goes back to is is true. Is he's so central and so. Elemental, you you can feel it. You 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 know. You see a Tom Hanks movie, it's like okay, I know who the character is. I got it. I'm good. I'm good. Whether he's flying flying a plane, landing on the moon, whatever, we got him. We know what he's doing. So this movie is solely based on an American naval officer waging the Battle of the Atlantic. It, it, it is. I, I can't think of another like micro history movie more than this movie is focusing on on three days uh, of one convoy battle uh, on one ship with one person to kind of represent the entire Battle of the Atlantic, you know, that, that as Joe said, spanned the entire war. And, and in some ways, one of the things I think that gets a, a short shrift in this movie is the coordination of that this is not just an American movie. I you know I gotta wonder if if we had a Royal Navy, you know, person here, if we had a Canadian here, if we had a Polish here who got written out of this movie entirely, what they would think about it. So let's talk a little bit about the coordination that's involved because again, it's an American who's commanding this unit. So Dave, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Anglo-American coordination uh in the Battle of the Atlantic. Well, this was a major point of contention in, in actual historical fact in the sense that you have the, the First World War experience uh, that the United States Navy is actually participating really in the first coalition war of the 20th century. And they're learning a lot of lessons. And one of the lessons that the Americans do learn is that uh, maintaining an empire is really hard to do. Uh, Ernest King as a captain a temporary appointment in the First World War is actually, he becomes very good friends with Captain Dudley Pound at the Admiralty. And one of the things that Pound was always struggling with was maintaining supply lines to the empire. And the lesson that King learned from that First World War experience was that the British Empire is always tied to the pier. So in other words, in order to maintain the empire, you have to have all these bases around the world. And so the lesson that King really drives home at in the, in the interwar period is logistics. Logistics are supremely important for naval operations in King's mind. King's objective was to create a navy that did not need uh, bases uh, strewn around the world. He wanted to use oil to maintain operations at sea almost in perpetuity. And they did develop procedures to do that uh, during the interwar period. By the time you get to 1941, and Franklin Roosevelt uh, was was conducting the sort of global quasi war to use the Navy as a counterforce against Imperial Japan in the Pacific, and really ramping up for actual naval operations against potential adversaries in the Atlantic in 1941 with the ABC uh, one agreement, and then of course the rainbow plans and plan dog and all of that stuff that came in 41. You have some interesting characters uh, from the British side and the American side working up the, the basic framework that would enable the Royal Navy and the US Navy to operate in the context of the Second World War. One of them is a guy named Captain Arthur Wellesley Clark, who is actually in Washington, DC, and they're trying to figure out how the U.S. Navy doctrine would synchronize with Royal Navy doctrine. Of course, the Canadians had their own sort of uh, thing going on as well. So, you know, when we get to the movie part where it's 1942 and an American destroyer captain, 64 years old in reality, 42 in fiction, uh, is running uh, the the convoy uh, escort team, I, I mean, that's just... It's impossible um, from a historical standpoint. The doctrine didn't exist. Uh, there, there was no agreement among the Royal Navy and the, and the U.S. Navy, and certainly the Canadians were feeling sort of caught in between. Uh, you know, the, the 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 coordination among U.S. naval forces uh, in '41 with Royal Navy forces was a disaster. Uh, and so, if you if you go into 1942, efforts to work together. We're not working very well at all. And uh, it, it's not really worked out until 1943 with the Atlantic Convoy Conference. 
uh, and during the Atlantic Convoy Conference, they basically split up the North Atlantic from the Central and South Atlantic. And the North Atlantic became the purview of the Admiralty. But then the Canadians said, hey, we don't work for the Admiralty. We have our own Admiralty in Ottawa, and we're a sovereign nation. And so the western part of the Atlantic became Canadian territory, and the eastern part of the Atlantic fell under the Admiralty. So the Admiralty's sphere of control was really uh, cut down significantly so that the Royal Navy could continue doing business the way they wanted to do it. But in the Central and South Atlantic, Ernest King and the U.S. Navy uh, conducted aggressive hunter-killer operations with aircraft carrier uh, task groups and used intelligence with the specified purpose of sinking enemy submarines. Now, the British didn't like that tactic at all because they were very worried that the Germans would figure out that the Allies were reading their codes and ciphers. This, this was a major concern on the part of the British. And Ernest King basically said, well, let's assume they're going to figure that out. And by the time they do figure that out, all of their U-boats will be at the bottom of the ocean. So it's, it's an interesting contrast of perspectives when, you know, you have Churchill sort of uh, screaming with his fist, you know, at Germany from the citadel of uh, the home islands in, in Britain. And then Ernie King saying, you know, they can't, they can't sink enough ships. Uh, I'll be able to build more ships than the Germans could ever dream of sinking. So it's a different perspective. Uh, in in strategic ter terms in the war at sea that is completely missed in this fictional account. No, uh, I, I, I think you're exactly right. Joe, let me ask you uh, a question on this, because one of the things that I'm taking away, I just read Evan Mosley's new book on uh, the, the global maritime history of World War II. And one of the things that he talks about, he, he, this book came out a year after Craig Simon's book on, on the global history of World War II came out, the maritime side. And what Mosley talks about is he talks about the, the idea that the Atlantic was much more critical than the Pacific in many ways. Uh, he focused on that. He says that the role, royal, role of the Royal Navy is typically shrunk down when it should be elevated up because they have a lot more to cover. But more importantly, he says the Battle of the Atlantic was not as near run a thing as they tend to think it is. Uh, you know, this kind of goes that Clay Blair uh, argument right there. So I was wondering if, if you want to talk a little bit about the Royal Navy's role, because again, I, I think if you if you watch this picture, and, and I hate to say this, but is this is this saving Private Ryan? Is the U.S. Navy, you know, is 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 it the U.S. Army saving the day and you know invading France? And is, and is Tom Hanks once again storming the beaches and and saving the day to 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 the chagrin of the of the British? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think the point can be made. The Atlantic is critical because it's the vehicle for getting the United States into Europe, okay? You can't do torch, you know, you can't do husky, you can't do overlord if you don't cross the Atlantic. So it's important in that regard. Uh, the other thing, it goes back to, I think, a point Dave made as far as, you know, Germany first strategy that's agreed upon. Okay? So that does mean there's gonna be a focus on the Atlantic, but it, it does mean that Britain can't fight this war, it can't last. And you can't get aid to the Soviet Union if Britain isn't sustained. Okay? So you know, it's, but unlike the First World War, I don't think there was ever a point where Britain was within you know, six weeks of being starved out of the war. Okay? I mean, it's, uh, you have to bear in mind that when the war starts in 1939, it may be very convenient for Adolf Hitler, but it's not very convenient for the German Navy, you know, because the German Navy has been operating under the Anglo-German Naval Agreement, and that limits the size of their Navy until Hitler renounces that in April 1939. Well, you just can't start churning out a bunch of U-boats between April and September 1939. So the Germans are playing catch-up, too, in that regard, right? Uh, so you have that issue. I think the other thing to bear in mind, too, is convoy is very important because just the mere act of convoying ships together and not having them selling singly provides a great deal of protection to them. You can't find them, you can't see them, right? And even if you can't read German naval traffic, the traffic analysis and the interception allows you to do evasive routing. So half the convoys that cross over are never even detected by the Germans, let alone attacked, right? So convoying is very important. Uh, the other thing too is 
once the United States enters the war, they, that's what Churchill can say. You know, we won because he knows what the capacity of the United States is from an economic, from an industrial, from a manpower standpoint. And the problems that the British have is they've got too much war between 1939 and 19, January 1942. And uh, they, they struggle, but they're never at a point where they're going to lose the war as they were in the First World War. Chuck, let me ask you, as a resident air power expert, so this, oh man, this this movie is bookended by aircraft at the beginning and aircraft at the end. I I, I mean, you know, I think the Navy's going to love this movie. Uh, surface warfare officers are going to wrap themselves in their new leather jackets and just you know <laughs> love a depiction of surface warfare as never before seen. But I think the second group that loves this has got to be the U.S. Air Force. I mean, they have to because I mean, the entire time the Navy is running for air cover, the entire time, and 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 what was air cover the quintessential solution? To defeating the the German submarine in World War II, because it seems to be in this movie. That seems to be the, the, the solution. It certainly is a big deal. I mean, at the end, to 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 be able to cover the gap when you have more long range aircraft. Um, I mean, that's you know, this is again, it, this is one of those things that I think you know, it's coming through. I, I I hope you know from from what everybody's saying is that this is this is really a very complex long lasting series of campaigns really and i mean it, it's different phases um but there's so much you know dave was talking earlier about enigma uh and the change you know and and that's not just one story i mean that's an evolving story joe's been talking about you know sort of you know, the royal navy and how it, it it had so many tasks and and there were so many things that you know to, to think about the battle of the atlantic you know it, it gives you know, submarines and these escorts, the, the you know, all, it, it, they become the all of the story, but there, there is a lot more to the story. I mean, there's and, and different components of this. And, and so, um, you know, to think about, gee, you know, you're just talking about submarines and, and how many submarines, you know, you wind up building as this war goes on. I mean, the, the Navy for the Germans is probably the, you know, as, as always, the last thing that anybody seems to be thinking about. Uh, you know, they build a couple of capital ships and people might wonder, you know, was that really a, a decent allocation of resources? But on the other hand, you know, the, as long as Tirpitz survives, you know, the Royal Navy has to, to retain some focus on what happens if it comes out. I mean, you know, there's concerns over surface raiders and there's so. So anyway, no, I'm just trying to say that, you know, and it's kind of repetitive, but there are a whole lot of things that people have to be paying attention to. It's not just if you break the codes. Wow, you know, you 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 can, you know, you, you've got the Germans beat, and because that's not a constant, that's not a constant process. It's an evolving process that has ups and downs. And the same thing, you know, with 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 aircraft. You know, initially you don't have enough long range aircraft, and and aircraft are very useful because when we think about submarines, and these aren't nuclear submarines. These aren't today's submarines that stay submerged. These are basically, you know, surface vessels that can submerge for for you know amounts of time. So. If you have somebody up in the air, you can spot these things or at least stand a better chance of spotting these things. Um, so, so I'm not, you know, it's it's a component of this. I'm I'm trying to give you a very purple answer, Sal. I'm trying to say that you know, <laughs> you're doing all of well. These you're things, you're yeah, doing a good job the, with it. But, I, I, would, I, I would like to channel my inner king just for a second <laughs> on this. I, I would say that air power is absolutely crucial uh, to what un, unfolds in the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, but again, I, I think also in channeling the inner king, um, he was deeply frustrated with the Army Air Force uh, efforts to control all air power under a centralized command. And this, this goes with the British approach as well with the RAF and, and Coastal Command. And <clears throat> King was unwilling to sort of uh, allow uh, land-based aviators to try and play around with anti-submarine warfare because they weren't trained to do it and they weren't patient enough to conduct anti-submarine operations. What would happen with Army Air Force pilots is they were always looking for the target to hit, uh, but they didn't have the, the patience because of their training, really, uh, to linger and to loiter over an area for a long period of time uh, to deny the submarine the ability to recharge their batteries and all that on the surface. And the, the other thing I wanted to just quickly say 
Uh, I think that the, the global war at sea hinges on two basic things. One is logistics and the other is intelligence, not just intelligence from the standpoint of knowing where the enemy is, but intelligence from the standpoint of knowing how the enemy is thinking. And I think that by 1943, uh, the United States Navy had developed a, a capacity uh, on par, if not superior to the British in being able to anticipate the enemy point of view. Uh, and a lot of that is done uh, through the you know collection of intelligence information and the acclimation of data uh, to the point where you actually know the the, the names of indiv individual U-boat captains. Uh, that's pretty good stuff. Um, and I think that in in all respects, um, by the time you get to 1943, uh, it's it's a, a war of unrelenting pressure, which is the strategy that King always talked about: is keep unrelenting pressure on. Uh, but you can't get there until you figured out uh, how to work with the British, how to work with de Gaulle. I mean, there's another character altogether uh, within the context of an alliance. But then, of course, you have the joint problems where the, the Army Air Force is trying to create something new called the United States Air Force in the context of the Second World War. And they're really sacrificing opportunities to support tactical forces in the effort to prove the theory of strategic air power. And, you know, that to me was the wrong forum for them to do that. And, I, and again, I'm just channeling my inner king here. Let me uh, wrap up with this with a, a question to all of you, because again, we, we're doing a review of a movie. We're historians reviewing a movie. So we're not reviewing this based on how much we like the cinematography and the action. We're doing this based on history. So I want to I want to get a review from you on the movie, and and I also want you to you know if you had the druthers and you you were called upon by a Hollywood producer, what would you produce? You know what would be the the, the movie you would produce that depicts this? So let, let me start off with with the review process. Number one, I learned something very important in this movie, and that was I was unaware of how many broken dishes and mugs happened during the Battle of the Atlantic. It was it, the cutlery on board a ship was just at the the expenditure of the amount of plates on the bridge of that ship was 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 amazing to me it just it really was every every other scene they're wiping up some 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 debris on the bridge so uh the the rating system we're going to use and i get this from a, a podcast called friendly fire where they come up with a unique rating system for every movie is a broken coffee mug so so he so, said you know out of five broken coffee mugs how would you rate the historical accuracy of the movie and so i'll start off since i'm giving this to you is I'm going to give it about a two two out of uh, two point five two point five because I thought it just came in a little short historically accurate but I am one of those people who will argue that any history if it gets people interested in it is good history and it gets them out in reading it just as Dave says it makes our job a little harder going forward and the movie I would make on the Battle of the Atlantic would use a a, a ship called the the John Brown. Uh, or, or actually, or uh, the, the uh, Morgan. Uh, there are two Liberty ships left in the United States, uh, pristine Liberty ships that are in the exact condition they were in in World War II. And I, I would use one of those two Liberty ships to depict not just a single battle, but, you know, their voyages during the war to the beachhead in Normandy, you know, kind of use that as a depiction. I, I think, and they actually sail too, unlike the kid, which is in a permanent kind of dry dock down in Baton Rouge. I would use uh, one of those two Liberty ships. I think that would be a, a great depiction of that. And you can use stories from other ships to, de you know, you could make the generic Liberty ship and use some stories from there to depict it. But th that would be my depiction. So Dave, I'm going to go over to you. What, what, what's your rating on, on, uh, of this? Uh, so if it's five broken coffee cups to be a bad movie, then it's five broken coffee cups. <laughs> uh, in, in all respects. <laughs> Um, but I would say as a fiction on par with Star Wars or Star Trek, I think it's five filled coffee cups full of steaming coffee uh, if it's a fiction. Uh, I think there are some people who will appreciate this movie for the action, uh, who will always uh, think that Tom Hanks is, is just the bee's knees, which you know, I, I think he's a great guy. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I think his you know, Beatles fiction was one of the best movies I've ever seen uh, in terms of the Beatles. Um, but this movie as a history, 
uh, Greyhound is a, is a real mess uh, on the floor with broken coffee cup pieces everywhere on the deck. Um, if I were to choose, if, if somebody called me and said, Dave, you know, w w what movie should we make about World War II? Well, um, it's a hard question for me to answer because in some respects, I would argue uh, you, you should make the movie about Ernie King's Navy, which is a global Navy. Um, and you could do it by looking at his headquarters in Washington uh, and, and how that headquarters sort of pioneered the way the U.S. Navy became a, a global Navy, quote unquote, second to none uh, in all respects. And there's some interesting aspects to that story that um, will will appear in my forthcoming book. And so, yeah, you know, I'm selling that. But if if Good we luck. were um, if we were to pick. Uh, a, a story from the war at sea that is right off the shelf. I would say that uh, Dan Gallery's stuff, uh, uh, 20 million tons under the sea, his memoir uh, as a hunter killer captain on board the USS Guadalcanal in task group 22.3, uh, conducting hunter killer operations in the central Atlantic uh, after 1942, uh, during which he he ends up capturing the U-505, which is probably the biggest war trophy in the United States. Uh, the German submarine U-505 was captured uh, in, in two days before the D-Day landings in June of 1944, and then it was towed to Bermuda, uh, which is a, a long way from where it was captured off the coast of Africa, and, and they were able to tow it there uh, without the Germans knowing that the U-boat had been captured, uh, the crew of the U-505 was then sequestered at Camp Ruston, Louisiana, and there's some really interesting German perspectives uh, that could be gleaned from the story of the crew as they are interrogated by the U.S. Navy uh, after the capture. And then, of course, we have to ask ourselves the question, why is this German submarine in uh, Chicago? To this day at the Museum of Science and Industry. And I think that that whole story could be told in a cinematic way that would resonate with multiple different audiences uh, because of the characters involved. In, in all respects, I would argue that the women who served in the submarine tracking room of Ernest J. King uh, in, in Washington, D.C., are the ones who are most responsible for the capture of the U-505 perhaps even more so than the boarding teams themselves. But you'll have to see that in the movie when I when we publish it. <laughs> now, now I want to see the movie, Dave. Now now you got me going. You sold me that movie. We have to put this on online to make sure we get this over into producers' hands. All right, your evaluation, Chuck, on, on, on how many – I'll edit that out. <laughs> how no, many, you know, I, I, what Dave said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think the U-505 and Dan Gallery, I think that would be really, you know, good fodder for a movie. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's something that I think, uh, you know, a number of people are, are, are aware of, and it's something that physically people can actually connect with. Um, if, if you find yourself going through Chicago, um, you know, maybe, maybe my imagination is a little bit more limited than everyone else's. Uh, maybe, maybe the best movie on this has already been made the cruel sea. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, maybe if you want to, you know, spruce that up, dust it off and, and remake it. Um, but there, there is a certain level of authenticity there with Montserrat having served in the Royal Navy, Royal, you know, Royal Navy volunteer, whatever, you know, volunteer reserve. Um, but, you know, that's that is a sailor, an officer, a veteran uh, putting down his his reckless. I mean, it's, it's really kind of hard uh, to, to top that in terms of something that, that that's truly authentic. I mean, a lot of what Forrester. And this didn't come out yet. Nobody was talking about it. But a lot of what Forrester was passing on, you know, was was information that he had gleaned uh, from sort of his escort officer uh, while he was doing his his propaganda work, as Dave was uh, as as Dave was 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 telling us. So in a sense, you're getting secondhand, you know, secondhand sea stories. Whereas at least with Montserrat, uh, you're getting it from the horse's mouth, you know, you know. And so anyway, but I would that's that's it. I'd either go with Dave's. With with Dave's suggestion, or I would uh, dust off the cruel sea and 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 revisit that. Yeah, how many uh, broken coffee cups would you give? Oh, broken coffee cups. 
Uh, I'm going to play it safe and, and and go with two and a half, just like you, Sal. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's good. That's good. Neither, neither bad nor good, right down the middle. I right. mean, you know, enough enough that I find, you know, reason to be critical, uh, but enough enjoyment that I don't regret, you know, having to go through the trouble of pulling it up on Apple TV. There you go. Well, that's that's a chore in itself. It's the Battle of the Atlantic was easier, I think. <laughs> Joe, your evaluation. Okay, so I'll first I'll do the uh, broken coffee stuff. Mine would be about three. Okay, I mean, I'm. Not as critical, I think, as Dave, although I could be convinced to go to five, but I, I did take some enjoyment out of watching it. And uh, again, so, and I did certainly read the, I read the book of nothing else because of the movie. And I, I did enjoy reading the book. As far as uh, another story, well, I don't have one to pick out, but I do have a, a, an event to pick out, and I do have a model to overlay on that event. And the event would be the, Convoy PQ-17, which was scattered, ordered by Dudley Pound, and of course, suffered grievously uh, by the Germans. Now, I think that was primarily a air and surface action as opposed to necessarily U-boat action. And the model for depicting that would be another Forrester book that was uh, made into a movie, Sink to Bismarck, okay? Where I think that movie captured the tension at an operational strategic level, and then it would uh, juxtapose the tactical situation, right? So you had a sense of the greater war, you had a sense of the pressure that leaders, senior naval leaders were operating under and the trade-offs they had to make as you uh, went after the Bismarck, you had then to sacrifice the escorts to certain convoys to, because you only had so many ships to go around. And I think the destruction of PQ-17 is a significant event, a real world event that uh, would capture people's, uh, I guess you would say what, interests. You have to bear in mind though too, that Tom Hanks is making a movie primarily for Americans and an American audience. And so uh, I really don't have anything to offer up in that regard, but I would say EQ-17 and Sink to Bismarck. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, on behalf of NASA for taking your time out to do this uh, uh, Naval Historian review of the movie Greyhound. Uh, I want to thank Chuck Steele, David Cohen, and Joe Moretz for taking their time out on a Saturday afternoon to come with us and talk about the movie. Uh, we're looking forward to perhaps doing more reviews in the future. I think this is a fun way for historians to look at a movie critically and evaluate them. Uh, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to do this. Uh, if you enjoy this video and you want some more videos from NASO, then I recommend you log in at www.naso.org. That's our webpage. You can become a member of NASO. You can follow us on our YouTube page or on Twitter at NASO underscore slash history. And more importantly, you can get our quarterly journal, The Northern Mariner, which we publish jointly with the Canadian Nautical Research Society. I want to thank our historians for coming out for a great review and a great discussion on the movie Greyhound. I'm not sure if we're sending anyone to the movie theater to want to go see it now or not, but I, I, I think what, what we're probably doing here is making people look at that movie again a second time a little bit more critically. And I think that's the best thing we can do and maybe give you some resources to look at to find out the history behind the movie. So once again, thanks guys. I appreciate you guys coming out and hopefully I'll see you soon.